usually don't start a message this way, but uh, today uh, this message is unique in that I'm answering a question you probably didn't ask me, all right? And the question is this, who is Jesus Christ? You might say, oh, that's, that's easy. Well, let me tell you, dear friend, it is almost hard to believe that we would have to answer such a question as that, but we are living in a post-Christian era in America, a post-Christian age, and there are many people, even the, in the United States, let me go further, even in churches, who really do not know who he is. You might say, you got to be kidding me. No, I'm not kidding. I'm dead serious about this. Some say, uh, if you ask them, who do you believe Jesus Christ is? They'll say, well, he was, a, he was a teacher. Some will say he was a good man. Some will say, well, he's a prophet. Um, some would say he was a rabbi. Uh, some will say he's a God, a God. More about that in a few minutes. Okay? An example, a way shower. Okay, uh, a nice guy. Some would say he was uh, just a drifter. All kinds of ideas on who he is. Well, you know, I think it's very important for us to understand what the Bible says about who he is because the Bible is the authority. It is the Word of God. We believe it, okay? Um, uh, from cover to cover, even we even believe the Bible where it says, Holy Bible on it, okay? So go with me today over to the Gospel of John, John chapter 1. John chapter 1, who is Jesus Christ? Now, you may think, oh, I already know this, I'm going to turn off. Please don't turn off because, friend, we're going to tie some scriptures together today that I believe will enlighten all of us as far as this issue. Who is Jesus Christ? So much of who Jesus Christ is is explained very clearly in John chapter 1. The gospel of John, you know, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The gospel of John is the gospel that presents Jesus Christ more than any of the others as God himself, God in the flesh. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but let's look at it. In John chapter 1, in verse 1, it says this, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Okay, the first thing we see very simply is that Jesus is the Word. He is the Word. Now, the word for that is logos, and it means the, the thought, the concept, or the expression of something, okay? That's what the word, word means, the thought, concept, or expression of something. We use words the same way today. What do we do? We express our thoughts and concepts through words. We, we speak them, all right? Uh, very, very important to understand that. Jesus, here's what it's saying. Jesus is the perfect manifestation or expression of God himself, all right? And we're going to see that in Scripture here. We can understand God much better by looking at Jesus, you know, uh, sometimes people say something like, well, I don't know what to do in this situation, or, or I don't know how the, how the Lord would handle this situation, or this or that. Now, now, I understand some situations we get in are complicated, but you know what? If you really want to get a good idea of how God would handle a situation, study the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You will see, and I do not apologize for this statement, you will see God in action through the life of Jesus. You might say, how is that? Well, because he is the word. He is the exact expression of God himself. Hold your place here and look with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. We can understand God better by looking at Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, it says this, God who at sundry times or various times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now, are you there? Hebrews 1, look at verse 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, watch this, by whom also he made the worlds, verse 3, 
who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his, perp- of his person. Okay? The exact image, the idea of the express, an exact replica, uh, 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 replica, or not a replica, but the manifestation of him. And upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. By the way, just a little sidebar note there. You notice Jesus by himself purged our sins. Do you see that? Okay. That's why, folks, the idea that some religions have, such as something called purgatory, what is purgatory? I was raised Catholic. I know exactly what it is. It's a place where, and, and by the way, there is no such place. Let me say that on the front end. But it's a place where people go who, quote unquote, aren't good enough to get into heaven, but aren't bad enough to go to hell. So you go there and you kind of get refined Okay, and that is purgatory. It is to purge sin away. And of course, that's not the way it is. No, listen, there is no purgatory. It says here, Jesus by himself purged our sins. When you trust in him as Savior, your sins are taken care of. That's the beauty of the gospel. That's the beauty of the gospel, okay? You notice in verse 1, in the beginning was the word... And the Word was with God. The Word was with God. In other words, the Word was God. Now, the the Greek text, for those of you who would be interested in this, it's just just a tad more, uh, in my mind, emphatic, where it says this. Literally, uh, it says the Word was God. God was the Word. That's what it is. It's a, a very strong statement. God was the Word, okay? The Word was God. God was the Word. What is that saying? Well, that leads us to our second point. He is God. Jesus is God himself. Look with me. We're in John. Go with me to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. I remember uh, years ago when I first read this verse, I just about got chills. Uh, The way it is recorded and how awesome the Lord was in the way he, he said this and how clear he, ma- he uh, made it known. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. It says in verse 6, Now Jesus is with his disciples, and Jesus saith unto him, and the him there was Thomas. Okay. You know, I, I wish somebody would come up with a different name for him than Doubting Thomas. Okay, I always want to go hide when they say that. Oh, what's your name? Uh, you know, uh, my name's um, anyways, you know my, well, some of you may not. My first name is Tom or Thomas. Anyways, irony. Here's an irony for you. I was named after a Catholic priest. Okay. My mom had aspirations for me. Now, from a Catholic perspective, something went wrong. From a biblical perspective, something went right. All right? And I'm delighted, by the way, with it. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. By the way, at the Benton County Fair, uh, one of the Catholic groups, there's several Catholic groups. There didn't used to be any. But there's several Catholic groups in the, in the building there where we're at, uh, And it says, this is interesting, it says up on a banner, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's all it says. Okay? It doesn't say who said it, and it doesn't define it. See, folks, here's the the truth of it. Jesus is the one who said it because he's the Savior, and he is the only way to heaven. Through faith alone, in Christ alone, is the only way way to heaven. You can't get there another way. It's not what he did and what you did. It's all of what Christ did. Remember, by himself he purged our sins. All sins been paid for. There's nothing left for us to do except trust in him by faith. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He's speaking to them, if you had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth know ye him. Now look at this. And have seen him. Is he trying to tell them something? 
you've seen them. Well, they still don't quite get it. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, (laughs) and it sufficeth us. Here it is, verse 9. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Look at this next phrase. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? What's he saying? You want to see the Father? You're looking at him. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Why? Because Jesus said in John 10, I and the Father are one. Okay? He's God. He's God. Which leads us to that second point. He is God. In John 1, 1, it says the Word was God, or God was the Word. Now, this is significant. This is where true Christianity and the cults have a major difference. Because your Jehovah's Witnesses, as an example, Christian cult, or a cult, I won't even call it Christian, They do not believe Jesus is God co-equal with the Father. They do not believe that. And they'll dance all around that and try to get you to think something differently. As a matter of fact, they actually translate John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with it. The Word was a God. That's what they have in their New World Translation, okay? Which is a corrupt translation. The Mormons careful, careful. Well, the Mormons, they're, they're Christians. They just, they just have some different terminology. Let me tell you something. They're not. According to the Word of God, the Mormon faith is not a biblical faith. Their Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible, all right? They do not believe Jesus is God himself co-equal with the Father. They do not believe it, okay? The Mormon church teaches that Jesus Christ progressed to godhood. That's blasphemy. Having first been procreated as a spirit child by a heavenly father and a heavenly mother, he was later conceived physically through intercourse between the heavenly father and the virgin Mary. You might say, I didn't know that. Well, you didn't know it because it's not true. Okay, it wasn't true. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. See, it was Jesus as God manifested in the flesh. We call that the incarnation, when God himself took on a human body. And he was the God-man, the only one who has ever lived. All right? John chapter 1, back to John chapter 1. You notice it says the same, the same. Who is the same? The Word, God. The same was in the beginning with God, okay? The word beginning denotes a start. It has to do with the start of all created things. We see that coming out in verse 3. We'll get there in a moment. That means, listen, that means Jesus Christ was there before anything else was there. He has to be God if he was there before anything else was there. Why? Because everything else was created. He must be God. He is God, and yet he is a distinct person in the Godhead, the Trinity, okay? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, three persons. You might say, explain that. I really can't explain that, but that is what the Bible teaches, okay? There are people who say, well, don't you know that the word Trinity is not in the Bible? Yeah, and guess what? The word Bible's not in the Bible. There's a lot of things in uh, words, uh, truths that we know they're not, the word is not in the Bible. The, the word rapture is not in our English translation, all right? But we know the rapture of the church is coming. We know it could happen at any time. 1 John 5, 7 says, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, <laughs> And the Holy Ghost, these three are one. Okay? That's about as clear as you can get. That's amazing because 1 John 5, 7 is one of the most attacked verses in all of Scripture. There's a reason for that, folks. There's a reason for that. Well, don't you know it's not in the best translations? Well, number one, what are the best? You're going to have to define the word best. 
And number two, it's in many translations of the past. People have the idea it it never existed until the King James Version came out. No, friends, it was there a long time before the KJV came out. It's part of the text. I have no doubt about that. Go back to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, distinct from the Father, and the Word was God, verse 3. Or, excuse me, verse 2. The same was in the beginning with God, verse 3. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Number three, he is the creator of all things. Now, please follow, folks. We are coming up to something now that is an incredibly important thing in the days in which we live. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. It is not accidental that John starts his gospel where he is manifesting Jesus as God in the flesh, and he says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Genesis 1.1 says what? First verse in the Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, okay? Or the heaven and the earth. There are two sub-points I want to mention on this, him being the creator of all things. First is this, only God could be the creator of all things. If Jesus is less than God, then God created Jesus. But wait a minute, that's not possible, because Jesus was there before anything else was. He has to be God. Only God was there before anything else was. He's the creator of all things things. Can anything be clearer than this? Jesus Christ cannot be a creation of God because he made all things. If he made all things, he's not a creation of anything. You might say, well, how can, you know, the people today, I, I can't accept that. Why not? Well, who made God? Who made God? Nobody made God. See here, friend, listen very carefully. Let me give you some friendly advice. Because you cannot wrap your mind around something doesn't mean it's not true. The problem is not with God and the Bible. The problem's with you. Oh, don't throw stones. The problem's with you. And by the way, people who do that, throw stones, try to kill you, call you ugly names and all that, you know why they do that? Because they don't have a reasonable argument. So all they can do is hurl accusations, insults, mischaracterizations, and all the rest of it at you and me. No, the Bible is very clear. Only God is the creator of all things. I want you to see a significant passage, Colossians chapter 1. Hold your place in John 1. We'll be back. That's our anchor today, John 1. Colossians chapter 1. Look at the clarity of the language. And by the way, I'm not giving you everything I had on this. I wish I could, but we'd be here probably till tomorrow morning. There's so much. There's so much here. Colossians chapter 1. Referring to Jesus, okay? Referring to Jesus. Look at the clear language. For by him were all things created. How many things? All things things. You know what that means? Nothing that was created came before him. He created everything. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Verse 17, it's referring to Jesus in the context it's talking about him. Verse 17, and he is before all things. Listen, there's a good reason we call it Christianity. Because it's about Jesus Christ. Okay? And it's all about Jesus Christ. It's all about him. So, here he is the creator of all things. First off, only God could be the creator of all things. Only God could. Therefore, Jesus is God. But secondly bringing it up to current events today and the day in which we live, folks, if creation, I'm just going to be very kind but very straightforward with you today, if creation is true, then evolution is a lie. 
There is no kind word for evolution, except it is a lie. It is a, and, 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 and Satan is the father of lies. Therefore, evolution, the theory, false theory of evolution, comes from Satan. I know that's strong language, okay? I don't hate anybody. You know, the first thing, you say something like that. That's hate speech. That's hate speech. Well, define that. Well, it's hate speech. You're prejudiced. You're narrow-minded. You're, you're arrogant. You're proud. You're a homophobe. You're, you're, you know, bigoted. Oh, that's a big one now, right? You're, you're bigot. You're bigot. You're prejudiced. You're racist. Oh, that's the, that's the one. That's at the top now, right? But names. You're racist. Oh, I disagree with you? Yeah, you're a racist. Well, def- <laughs> define that one for me. Figure, hey, hey, listen, I want to know more about this. I've never heard this kind of craziness before. Friend, listen. If evolution is true, Jesus Christ was a fraud. He was a liar. And the word of God, you can just throw it out. And listen. That is why evolution is pushed as hard as it is, okay? Listen, this issue is not an intellectual one as much as a spiritual one. If, you, if, if evolution is true, the Bible is not. What about theistic evolution? That's, most, that's totally ridiculous. You cannot harmonize that with the Bible, okay? Okay? The Bible, just the way it reads, is the way it is. Well, I don't understand. You know, every, there's billions and billions and billions of years. They can't prove that, okay? It's all, it's all made up. You read the Bible and listen. Thank you to creation scientists today who are every, every single day coming up with new proofs that the Bible has not, or not the Bible, that the world has not been around, the universe has not been around for billions and billions and billions of years. No, if creation is true, then evolution is a lie. If creation is not true, then neither is the Bible. This is why the war is going on. This is why people get so mad. This is why it is such a passionate thing. This is why people who aren't even necessarily Christians are being fired from research groups and universities simply because they question the validity of evolution. There's a reason it's happening. It's a spiritual reason. It's an undermining of the Word of God because there's no salvation, there's no meaning to life, there's nothing if the Bible's not true. And evolution is true. But if the Bible is true, evolution cannot, I repeat, cannot be true because it is diametrically opposed to creation. Number four, back to Genesis 1, or not Genesis 1, John 1. Number four, we find it in verse 4. He is the source of eternal life. This is an exclusive truth. He is not only the source, he is the source of eternal life. Look at John 1, verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 10, it says this, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He, he that believeth not God hath made him, or is calling him, a liar. Why? Because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Verse 12. I know I've said this before, but friends, God cannot make it easier than this. Every word in verse 12 is single syllable. Okay? He that hath the Son hath life. You see it? And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Nothing complicated. If you have Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have the Son, you have everlasting life. If you reject him, you don't believe the record that God gave him in the Word of God, that he is God, our Savior, who paid for our sins and rose from the grave, you do not have life. 
Jesus, in John chapter 6, verse 47, again, one of the simplest verses in all of the Bible, he said this, he said this, Verily, verily, that means truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath, that is present tense, right now, what kind of life? Everlasting life. See, the religious teachers of the day couldn't take it, that kind of talk. That's why they wanted them dead. They knew, folks, you know, I, I hear people say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. What? What? They wouldn't have wanted him dead if he didn't claim to be God. That's the whole reason they wanted to kill him is because he claimed to be God and they knew it. To them it was blasphemy. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. You might say, well, I, I believe Jesus existed. Am I going to heaven? Do I have eternal life? No, friends, it's, it's more than believing he was a historical figure. Let me explain to you this issue of getting everlasting life. Look up here. I like to use this illustration. Made it clear to me. Forty-seven years ago. It's not easy to count backward that far. Okay, look up here. This hand representing you and me, and let my wallet represent our sin. Here we are, we're all sinners. God loves us, according to the Bible. That's the message of the Word of God. God loves you. He hates your sin. He loves you. You see, to get to heaven, you have to be sinless in the eyes of God, and no one is. Heaven's a perfect place. Not even one lie can get in. I, talked, I was shocked yesterday. I talked to an older gentleman at the fair. Okay? Him and his wife said they're not sinners. They're not sinners. So then I had to bear down a little bit, and as the conversation went on, I saw the conviction of the Holy Spirit coming over the man's face. I mean, I, it, his whole countenance was starting to change. Of course, the grandkids got balloons, and, and uh, they, they kept interfering, and so they had, to, they had to go. I was able to give them the gospel. I was able to give them literature. Did he trust Christ? Not that I know of. I sure wish he had. Okay? Anyways, we are sinners. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us. Yet God says, because we've sinned, our sin must be paid for. If we pay for our own sin, folks, it's not by penance. It's not by good works. It's not by going to church, giving money, okay? Making promises with God that you're going to behave yourself better. None of those things will take away sin. The wages of sin is death. You'd have to die physically, and you'd have to be separated from God for all eternity. Death meaning, by the way, separation. So what are we going to do? If my good works will not get rid of my sin, and if I die with it, I'll be lost forever, then what am I going to do? Well, here's the good news. Here's the message of the Bible. Love still flows. Love still flows. This hand representing the Lord Jesus Christ. God in the flesh. You notice he doesn't have something we have. He was sinless because God is sinless. Entered the human race. When he went to the cross, he took my sin and yours upon himself, and he made the complete payment for all the sin we've done or all the sin we'll ever do till the day we die. Jesus paid it all. Remember, all of our sins were in the future at that point, right? Jesus paid for all of them, came back from the dead, and the Bible says if you will believe in him. That word believe means to put your faith, your trust in him. The moment you do, you're trusting in him as your savior. The moment you do, he gives you, according to the Bible, you notice it in John 6, 47, he gives you everlasting life. Life that lasts forever. That's eternity. You trust Christ the savior, all your sins are taken care of. He gives you everlasting life. You're going to heaven. You might say, well, how do, you, how do you know that? Well, because what's going to keep you out? All your sins are gone. All your sins are gone. But it's a gift. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. You can't work for it. You've got to be perfect. God gives you his righteousness when you trust Christ the Savior. You go to heaven on what Christ has done for you. 
Peter had it right. Peter got it. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, he said, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. By the way, that includes your name and my name. We, we will not get ourselves to heaven. Jesus is the only one who can get us to heaven. Number five, back to John chapter one. Number five, he is the light of the world. He is the light of the world. Boy, I'm touching on a lot of different things today. Okay? Verses five through nine, the word world applies to everyone. Okay? It applies to everyone. John 1, 5, and the light shineth in the darkness. He is the light of the world. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, John the baptizer. The same came for witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men, how many men? All men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Now, verse 9 is a very important verse. That was the true light, which lighteth, how many men? Every man that cometh into the world, okay? Two things I want you to glean from these verses. The first one is this. All men can believe and be saved. Why? Because it says that all men through him might believe. He's the Savior of all men. This is the Bible's message. For God so loved the world, okay? It's open, all men can believe and be saved. By the way, that means you. Possibly you came today and you weren't sure where you're going when you die. You came here uncertain of your eternity, where you'd spend eternity if you died today. Friend, you can leave today knowing you're going to heaven based on the Word of God. All you need to do is put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. He will give you everlasting life, not when you die, the moment you believe. That's what he said in John 6, 47. Remember, he that believeth on me hath, possesses now, everlasting life. You might say, this is, I don't know about this. This is too good to be true. I've never heard it before. Well, I'm not surprised you haven't heard it. I'm not surprised. Because the Bible tells us that Satan is working hard to keep people blind to this message. All men can believe and be saved, okay? That all men through him might believe, verse 9, and that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Why would God give light to every man if not everybody could be saved? Wouldn't that be just kind of a cruel joke teasing people? Here's the light, here's the gospel. Do you understand it, what Jesus did when he died on the cross? He, he paid for all sin. He paid for all sin. Here it is, here it is. Oh, I want to believe it. No, I'm sorry, you're not one of the elect. You can't believe. Why would God give light to every man if not every man could be saved? Let me just make a bold statement today. This is a no-tolerance zone for Calvinism, our church. Calvinism today, well, it's always been. It is a man-made philosophy it is not what the Bible teaches. It makes God a mean ogre that is unfair, all right? And I know there are people who will hear that and they'll say, well, uh, you don't understand it. No, oh, I fully understand it. I fully understand it, friend. He gives light to every man. The world can be saved, the Bible says. He is the Savior of all men, especially those that believe, okay? Okay? This is what the Bible says. He gives light to every man. Here's what Calvinism says. If you're not familiar with it, and you need to understand this, friend, because it's growing like crazy today. It's like an infection that's gone out of control. Here's what it says. Well, everybody's lost. Everybody deserves to go to hell. Okay? But what God has done in his wisdom and sovereignty, he chose certain people out of the human race to be his children, okay? And so what he does is he gives them 
uh, he, he sends efficacious grace towards them. That's a big word that means irresistible. And they can't help but believe. But wait, wait. He regenerates them. In other words, he gives them eternal life. He gives them life so that they can believe. Now, this is what Calvinism teaches. A lot of people don't know that. Now, let me ask you a question. Why do you need to believe if you're already born again? See, that's a false gospel. That's a false message of salvation. Now, that's what they believe. Not only that, but we are supposed to be glad that God chooses a few. And by the way, the number is very small. It is very generous on my part to say, just as an example, let's say for an example, God chooses 10% of all humanity to be saved. Those are the quote-unquote elect according to Calvinism. Here's what they don't want you to think about. What has he decided for the rest? Friends, it isn't that they, the rest don't want to be saved. It's that according to Calvinism, they can't be saved. They can't be. Because he has not chosen them. Okay? They're lost. He brought them. He, he knew they would be born Okay? He knew they would be conceived, and he also knew that he had, according to Calvinism, they were not chosen to go to heaven. And so why did he let them be conceived? Why would God, and again, I'm using these numbers randomly, but why would God say or determine, predestine, that according to the the uh, percentages I just gave, which are completely made up, I'm sure they're not accurate. But why would God say, okay, I'm going to create man, and I've already decided 90% of them will burn in an eternity in hell, and they have no chance of not going there. That's the dark side of Calvinism. And you're supposed to like it. Okay? Friend, listen. No, no, no. Salvation is open to every person on the planet who has ever lived since Adam and Eve. That is the message of the Word of God. And any other God is not a, the true God of the Bible. It is a grotesque caricature of the Word of God. You can be saved today. Anybody can be saved. All they need to do is hear the gospel Put their faith in Christ, and God will give them eternal life. He is the light of the world, not just the elect. He gives light to every man, not just the elect. Okay? If he's the light of the world, why would he give light to the world if the world could not be saved? It doesn't make any sense. Number four, or number six, excuse me. He is the Savior of the world. He's not only the light of the world. Once we can see through the light of the gospel, then we can trust in him as our savior because now we understand it. He is the savior of the world, verse 10 or verse 12. He was in the world and the world was made by him. See that? And the world knew him not. He came unto his own, his own people. Now some people will say, well that's referring to the Jews. It certainly would refer to them. It could also refer to all mankind. He came unto his own human beings. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, as many as received him. You notice the responsibility is on them to receive him. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Jesus, the name means God who is our Savior. Okay, God who is our Savior. Christ was not his last name. Christ is a title. It means the anointed one, the Messiah. When you trust in Jesus Christ, you're trusting in him that he is God who paid for your sins, who will save you. And when you do, he gives you everlasting life. You're believing on his name. Notice this, which were born not of blood. In other words, you don't go to heaven because your daddy was a preacher or something like that nor of the will of the flesh, okay? It's, it's not something that you can uh, uh, accomplish through 
uh, sacrifice and so forth yourself, giving stuff up, trying to behave, nor of the will of man, it's not by the schemes of man, how are we born? Not by blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And how are we born of God? When we trust in Christ the Savior, God gives us eternal life. Verse 14, and the word, God himself, Jesus, and the word became flesh, or was made flesh, and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Here's the truth today. Who is Jesus Christ? He is God, who is our creator, who is also our savior. He is the light of the world. He is the word, the living word. He is the source of eternal life. And you can have him as your savior today if you will put your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ alone as your savior. Friend, remember the illustration, here we are sinners? It's not he does his part, I do mine. We share the burden or the responsibility for my salvation. No, no, no. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's all of what Christ did. You either trust him to get you to heaven, or you're trusting in yourself. Well, you trust in yourself, you're rejecting the payment he made for you. I urge you to trust Christ today as your Savior. I know, I've been, I know I've been very straightforward. I've tried to be very clear and precise because you can't miss this, okay? We've got to understand it, and we need to believe. Let's all bow in prayer, shall we? Today, with every head bowed, please, and every eye closed, perhaps there's someone here today. You've never understood this until today. Friend, the offer is there. God is offering you eternal life. You can be saved. You can be saved. It's not by reformation. It's not by sorrow. It's not by promising. It's not by good works. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ that you can go to heaven. Would you today trust in him as your Savior right where you sit? You cannot make a mistake. God knows your thoughts. Why don't you get it settled right now? Okay? It's not, not a matter of saying a prayer, although you can express your faith that way. Okay? Saying a prayer doesn't save. It's faith in Christ that brings salvation. Will you trust him right now? Jesus said, he that believeth in me hath everlasting life. Would you trust him? Now, if today is the first time you've understood this, and today you trusted Christ as Savior, could I pray for you as we close? I will not embarrass you. I'm not going to manipulate you in any way. I'm not going to have you stand up, come up. Right where you sit, will you trust in Christ as your Savior? And if you're doing that, I would like to pray for you, okay, with heads bowed and eyes closed. I would like to know that you trusted Christ today, and I'd like to pray for you, not by name, but pray for God's guidance in your life. Is there anyone? who today said, you know what, I finally understood this. Today I trusted Christ and him alone as my Savior. Pray for me. Would you do that? Would you pray for me? Is there anyone? Just slip it up, put it down. Is there anyone? Is there anyone? God bless you. God bless you. You can put it down. Is there anyone else? Would you pray for me? Today I trusted Christ as my Savior. I see your hand. You can put it down. Anyone else? Pray for me. Today I trusted Christ as my Savior. Friend, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. Okay? If you died today without Christ as your Savior, you'll never have a second chance. I urge you to trust in him today as your Savior. Anyone else? Slip it up, put it down. Now again, you don't have to raise your hand. God will save you if you trust Christ. I'd just like to pray for you. Father, we thank you for your word today. Help us be lovingly bold with it. Help us stand on the truth of the Scriptures. Help us magnify, okay, Jesus Christ. Our, 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 our lives should glorify Him as believers. We thank you for this one who indicated that they are trusting Christ as Savior. We know, Father, that anyone who does, you that moment give them everlasting life. I pray now, Father, for your guidance and strength in this one's life, that they would 
continue to come and learn the Word of God and, and understand it and then grow spiritually and make good decisions that will be, bring blessings, your blessings, into their life. Help us, Father, to know that you desire us, Father, to know the truth because that is what makes us free. That is what makes us free. We thank you for this day. We ask you to guide us this afternoon. Bless the baptism. Also, Father, for tonight that you would bring us all back together and we could have a great time worshiping you and learning from your word. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.